Poe. Welcome everybody to the new year edition of uh, NCG seminar. So it's new year and hopefully in, in a few months we can meet directly face to face instead of uh, the Zoom thing. Actually, my eyes are beginning to complain about the screen. I, I guess you as well. <laughs> so uh, welcome and uh, our first speaker is Elmar Stroe from Leibniz University Hanover. And actually you can see his title, so I'm not going to read it loud. <laughs> Elmar, please. Thanks, thanks Welcome. for the opportunity to speak here. Um, it's a great pleasure. And what I want to speak about is joint work with Anton Savin. Um, and it's about a trial to do index theory for free integral operators. And there's a particular application to the kahn moscovici local index formula. Okay, but let's start me, uh, let me start with the setting. So what we have is a smooth manifold M and in this talk, this will always either be a closed manifold or a Euclidean space. Then we have a discrete group and uh, this group acts on L of L to M by quantized canonical transformation. So, this map G to phi sub G is a representation unitary by what, what I explained later, quantized canonical transformations. And what we are essentially interested in is the index theory of such objects. So you have operators which are compositions of usual pseudo differential operators and these quantized canonical transformations. That's a special class of four integral operators. And uh, first, the sum is going to be finite, so there's no problem of convergence, although you could do certain things. And, uh, and so, so why is this an interesting thing to look at? It's interesting because it covers a lot of standard situations. So, um, for example, if you don't have the four integral operators, then, or this means your group is just the identity, then you have the classical index problem, right? And then you just have to the differential operator, sorry. And, um, and that's the standard problem. If you don't have a pseudo differential operator, but just one of these um, quantized canonical transformations, that's the Atiyah Weinstein index problem. So that was proposed by Weinstein in 76 and was actually solved um, by Epstein Merrows in 98 for the case where this operator acts on the same manifold and for, by Leichner, Ness and Sigan in 2000 for the general case that the operator acts between different manifolds. Okay, the concept also includes with sort of a triplets variant the index theory for Dirac operators on Lorentzian space times, as it was initiated by Bernd Strohmeyer, where you have a Lorentzian manifold and you have APS, you have a time slice. So you look at this Lorentzian manifold globally hyperbolic for some time T0 and some time T1, and you impose to this Dirac operator, which of course is not elliptic because it's Lorentzian, APS conditions on one side and anti-APS conditions on the other side, then you obtain a flat time operator and it falls into this concept where phi g is the propagator associated with this thing. Okay, uh, a concept that has been studied very long is when phi g is actually the operator given by a different morphism of the base manifold. There's a lot of work by Anton Yevich and Lebedev on this, uh, but also Kahn Moscovici studied this situation, Davé, Perrault, Ponge, and so on. Okay, so this is a general concept and that's why it's interesting studying it. I should say a little bit about the details. So what's a canonical transformation, you probably all know, but maybe I repeat it. We take the tangent bundle, the cotangent bundle of this manifold, and we remove the zero section. Okay. Then a canonical transformation is a diffeomorphism of this object of T star zero M. That's what we call it. 
which preserves the symplectic form, uh, symplectic form, so that's a symplectic morphism. And additionally, it's one homogeneous in the fiber. So if, if y eta goes to x psi, then y and lambda eta goes to x and lambda psi for positive lambda. And um, the concept above that I showed you about for these operators, for operators of this type, if you want to show that these are an algebra, then you need that the four integral operators act on this, on the pseudo differential operators. And there is a theorem by Deusser, Martin Singer from the 70s, which says that any automorphism of the algebra pseudo differential operators which preserves the order of the operator is given by conjugation with the quantized canonical transformation. So basically, apart from this fact that the order is preserved, it seems that this is sort of the largest concept you could do in this setting. Okay, that's why it's interesting. Okay, simple examples of canonical transformations. As I said before, if you have a diffeomorphism of your base manifold, then you can lift it to the cotangent bundle to a canonical transformation on the cotangent bundle. And if alpha is the different morphism, we call this C alpha. And what C alpha does is it takes a point Y eta and maps it to alpha inverse of Y. And here the adjoint differential applied to alpha inverse of Y multiplied by eta. Okay, that's the standard. Um, transformation of the cotangent variable. The second example is if you take a Hamiltonian, so a real valued function on T star M, which is homogeneous of degree one, and you define the Hamiltonian vector field, so dH by D, okay, the Hamiltonian vector field, and you look at the flow, then for any time the flow map, which is a map on T star M, defines a canonical transformation. So that's an easy way to get um, quite complicated canonical transformations. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Um, now, what, what is a quantized canonical transformation? The, um, the first observation in this connection is if you have such a canonical transformation and you look at the graph of it and you change one of the signs, then you get a Lagrangian subspace of the product of the two manifolds. So of T star M with the zero section removed times T star M with the zero section removed. Um, the, the reason for the sign here simply is that on this space, you want to use the sum of the two uh, symplectic forms. If, if you would use the difference, then you could leave the sign as before. So it's a little bit confusing that you have the sign, but there's nothing serious behind it. Okay, so first observation, if you, have a, if you have a canonical transformation, then it defines a Lagrangian subspace. The second observation is this Lagrangian subspace can be described by a one homogeneous phase function. What does it mean? So you look at this object micro locally. So this is, this is a set in the product, in the Cartesian product. So you look at two points, x0, xi0, and y0, eta0, which are in the graph. So x0, xi0 is c of y0, eta0. And then you find a function phi, which is defined in neighborhood of x0 and of y0, times a cone in the Euclidean space of some dimension. And in this, in this setting, this set lambda is given as these points. So you take x, dx phi, y, and minus dy phi, minus this again due to this minus sign here, um, where you assume that the theta derivative of phi, that's a phi missing, is zero. 
So from the graph, you get a Lagrangian subspace. From the subspace, you get the phase function. And from this phase function, you can define a Fourier integral operator. And that's what we call a quantized canonical transformation. You just take a symbol and consider this kernel where you put the phi in the exponentials. So these are quantized canonical transformations, just to explain the setting. Okay. So the first question is if you want to, index, if you want to do index theory, um, when is such an object a fretime operator? Okay, in principle, these DGs could have different orders, but as you do in standard situations, always you reduce the order to zero. For this phi G, we had already assumed that the order is zero, so that it's actually a group of bounded operators on the space. So we assume that also the DG of order zero, this can always be achieved by uh, using an order reduction. And we denote by CG the canonical transformations associated with this G. So G gives you these quantized canonical transformations, but behind, of course, is a usual canonical transformation. So, so this G acts also on the cosphere bundle. It first it acts on the cotangent bundle, with the zero section removed, but since it's homogeneous, it actually acts on the cosphere bundle. So, and this allows us to define the symbol of this operator, what you do, you take such an element here and you define the symbol as the tuple that contains all the symbols of these DGs. So you can see this as an element in the cross product of C of S star M, that's where the symbol lives, uh, with G. And you can take the maximum cross product here that makes it easy to work with. Okay, and we call this the elliptic if the symbol is invertible. And the result that comes with it is what you expect. If you have an elliptic operator, then the associated um, operator on the two is Fretton. Okay, there are little problems with this. <laughs> the first thing is, depending on how your group is, it's not really clear that you have a unique representation of your operator. You might have different representations and, uh, and different representations actually might to different symbols. It's, it, it's not completely clear. It's certainly clear that we have a sufficient condition. So if one of the symbols is invertible, that is fretal, but um, is it always the case? Certainly this is not the case there's work on Anton by Antonievich and Lebedev for this. If the group is amenable and the action is topologically free, then everything is fine. But otherwise, we're not completely sure. And that's also why we wanted to look at examples. Um, what we did, and I just wrote one sentence. In this setting, you can, you can define localized analytic and algebraic indices. And we can show that they coincide. And um, I should also mention that there is a similar work for this by Gorohovsky, the Klein and Nest, who obtain an algebraic index theorem for equivariant operators. So, so that's a very similar situation, but it's not really clear yet what the connection between both theorems is. So there's, there's something open and of course, the situation is very abstract. So we decided we should look at rather concrete examples where you can see something. And um, the, the probably easiest case is you look at Rn, because in Rn you can do explicit computations. And our first result, so when we look at this, is an index theorem for operators associated with the metaplectic group. Okay, I'll explain what the metaplectic group is in, in a second. So, okay, now our manifold now is Rn. Instead of standard pseudo differential operators, we work with Shubin type pseudo differential operators. You probably have seen them before. If not, um, what's the difference between standard pseudo differential operators? So you have a function on Rn, which 
uh, sorry, on, on Rn times Rn, or I should interpret this rather as T star of Rn. Um, A of X and P, and the usual symbols estimates would estimate this in terms of the norm of this P. Instead, you estimate it by the norm of X plus the norm of P. So here you have this estimate here, one plus X plus P in norm to the power M. M is the order of the, of the symbol minus the derivative in X uh, in Psi and minus the number of derivatives in X. So both uh, X derivatives and Y de and Psi derivatives, sorry, this Psi should be a P, I'm sorry. Um, both derivatives lower the order. And we work with classical symbols. So they have an expansion into homogeneous terms, homogeneous both in X and P. And so the principal symbols in that case are functions on the full sphere in T star N, so on S 2N minus one. Okay, what, what is very helpful is to give the cotangent space a complex structure. So we take this X and P and map it to P minus I X. So we have a map between T star N and the complex numbers, the, uh, well, to the power N, so to C to the N. And in particular, we then have the group of unitary operators on CN and G, the group that's acting is supposed to be a discrete subgroup of UN. Okay, and now of course what we need is a representation of this by so four integral operators. And the operators we choose are the metaplectic operators. Okay, now I have to say what are met metaplectic operators? Uh, the metaplectic operators are operators that are generated, there's tons of definitions of metaplectic operators and um, you can consult either the classic by the Ray or there are two books by the Gosson and, and there's probably more, but, and, and you find all ways of expressing these operators. One way of expressing them, which, which I find rather nice is you take a homogeneous real quadratic form on T star N. You take the while quantization of this thing. So if H is this form, you call H hat the while quantization of this, and then you take the operator E to the I H. Okay, now you know um, when, when you have a real function and you take the Y quantization, then this is a self-adjoint operator. So we have E to the I a self-adjoint operator. So we get a unitary operator on our end. So we have a, a group of unitary operators. For, for our purposes, we need to enlarge this group a little bit. This has been done before, of course, um, by, by adding non-zero scalars. So you can rewrite this instead of just taking e to the i h, you take e to the i h hat plus phi, where phi is just a real number. So you have e to the i phi, the same thing as before, just non-zero complex uh, numbers in addition. Okay, and as I said before, real symbols give self-adjoint operators on the wild quanti on the wild quantization. So all the metaplectic operators our unitary operators on l 2 n So these are our four integral operators. Okay, we can describe them a little bit more. And, and in particular, we have to see why, why are they related to canonical transformations? Okay, we, we consider the symplectic group, SPN, as which is a, a subgroup of the general linear group of to dimension 2n. And um, so this is by definition the uh, group that preserves the symplectic form. Okay. Um, 
Now we have to connect the metaplectic operators to the symplectic group. How do we do that? Um, we know that you can generate the symplectic group by Hamiltonian. So you take a Hamiltonian, in that kind, H is supposed to be homogeneous, real and quadratic. You take the flow associated with this thing and you evaluate the flow at time one. So you have a diffeomorphism of your cotangent bundle. And this is automatically symplectic. That's what we saw before. And then the point is, so we have a projection. So to each of these metaplectic operators, you can assign a symplectic um, matrix by just taking this h hat to the h and then the corresponding symplectic form. So that's that's a nice projection. It's it's not completely trivial because the metaplectic operators form a double cover of the symplectic group. So um, you cannot simply represent symplectic matrices by metaplectic operators. And that's a difficulty in the beginning. So you have to do something about this difficulty because, okay, we want to quantize our canonical transformation. So we want to quantize symplectic elements. Okay, we can't do it with all of them, but we can lift at least the unitary operators, which form part of the symplectic group. What um, with a little bit of uh, work. Okay, what do we do? As I said, we, we identify the cotangent space with complex space by mapping xp to the complex number Z, uh, p minus ix in Cn. We have the complex structure. And then the unitary group is isomorphic under this thing with the symplectic elements intersected with the uh, orthogonal group. Okay. And um, if you look at how the unitary matrices look, then they have the following form. They are exponentials of, of the form B plus IA, where A is real and symmetric, and B is Q, and both are n times n. So, this is a nice thing, and this gives us the connection between the two things. And now what we do is the following. We want to associate to this unitary. So the unitary sit in the symplectic group. So the symplectic elements are the ones we are actually interested in, right? We want to quantize these canonical transformations. Um, we take this subset, which contains the identity, and try to lift from the subset to the metaplectic operators. Of course, one point is simple. Um, the identity has to go to the identity. So we start at the identity and then choose a section in, in this way. So we go from the unitary group to the complex metaplectic group by taking this inverse of this projection. Okay, I'll say more and multiply it by the term of G and you do this close to the identity. Okay, um, the point is this thing extends to all of UN and is a group monomorphism. So it can't be different, it can't be an isomorphism because it's a double covering. So it's a monomorphism of groups. And you can describe it more explicitly. I said before, the UN of this form. So if you have um, a symmetric A and a skew symmetric B, you can define a quadratic form from this quite easily. Just write it as here. And um, a, a unitary is of this form. So the metaplectic operator associated with this unitary is just the exponential of i times this h. So 
to do it more slowly, oh, sorry, we have this representation of UN by B plus IA. We define from this, this matrix, have a quadratic form. And this quadratic form both gives us an symplectic element and this H hat, the, the quantization of this thing. And this is a factor so that it all uh, matches up. So that's E to the minus I H hat times the exponential that's half the trace of, of A. Okay, that's the idea how you go from unitary somatoplectic operators. And of course, here it's here you see that you get, of course, complex numbers into the game. So we have to go to the complex metaplectic group. Okay, so these are our operators. You can describe it, um, and in particular, if you want to work with it um, more explicitly. So what, what you notice is that as a group, UN is generated by the orthogonal group um, and U1. So just where, where U1 sits in, in UN as just the diagonal matrix where you have one non-bond element in, in the front and the others around. Okay, you see already with ON, you can move this E to the I phi, uh, wherever you want. And it's, it's not so difficult to see that you generate in this way, the whole group. So actually what you have to look at is basically just these two cases where you have either an orthogonal um, map or a U1 in this form. So how do you define this RGs that we had to, to do before? Well, if it's orthogonal, then we just take the usual action by G inverse. And if it's of this form, well, then we take this operator here. So it's E to the I phi um, times one half minus H1. H1 is the, um, the operator that's associated with um, x squared plus x1 squared plus xi1 squared. So it's the operator x1 squared minus the x1 squared. Okay. Okay, this, these operators are so-called fractional Fourier transforms. If, if you want to read about this, there's a, a, an article by Hermanda on the classification of, of um, quadratic forms. And, and you find a lot of information there. Among others, okay, what you also know from other sources is Mailer's formula for, for these operators. So you can write these operators as integral operators with a phase function and um, and the function here. So Rg applied to a function u of x is this prefactor and this quadratic phase function times u. What, what you see is, um, okay, this is a free integral operator. The phase is now quadratic. This is due to the fact that we work with Shubin type operators. So it changes from first order to quadratic. And um, as a particular case, you see if, if phi is pi over two, then this here vanishes. So you just have one over two pi and the square root of it. And then the exponential of minus x1, y1, so sine is one. So you just have the Fourier transform. So it's, this is why it calls fraction Fourier transforms. In, in special cases, it's just the Fourier transform. In general, it's this expression here. Okay, so we have an action of UN, of actually the whole group acts on the free, um, on the Shubin type pseudo differential operators and it acts by conjugation. So um, an element G goes to the conjugation, uh, goes to the operator that conjugates an operator A with such an RG. And um, 
the result is if, if A is in the Shubin operator, then this is again a Shubin operator. And you can also determine the principal symbol. The principal symbol of this operator is just given by the action of G inverse on the, on the, on the symbol of A. Okay, now we have to change the concept or we do basically the same thing. If we have an operator of this form, we associate it to the symbol and the symbol is um, again, this tuple of the symbols of the DGs, but now it's a function in C of S to N minus one. That, that's the new symbol space um, on which G acts. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, in order to index, to do index theory, we need to have these operators acting on projections. So we choose two projections associated with the um, Krupsi algebra of this thing and, uh, and take such an operator. Now the operator is considered between the images of these two projections, P1 and P2, which are of course subspaces of Rn and they live in some high dimensional Cn space. And um, now we want to, to speak about the elasticity of, of such a tuple of projections. So this is basically the analog of operators acting in sections. And you call this thing elliptic. If you find an sort of inverse to this, so you find a matrix of functions in this cross product such that it's a left inverse and a right inverse modulo the images of these projections. So R sigma multiplied by the left from P1 is P1 and multiplied uh, sigma R multiplied from the right by P2 is P2. And what you see is ellipticity, sorry, implies the Fredholm property. So can we say something about the index? Yes, we can. Um, for a unitary, we can define a trace. So um, the trace associated with this unitary is a map, say, on functions on CN with values in forms to C. And we take such a form and evaluate it on the fixed point set of S and integrate over the fixed point set of S. So, so that's the, the point, we go over the fixed point set, then we get for each S a closed graded trace from the space here. So C infinity with compact supports and CN, the values and the corresponding forms on which you enact to C. And um, what, what you simply do is we take um, this, this trace is indexed not by S, but by the conjugacy class of S by taking all the traces of the tau Gs on the corresponding um, elements of AG. So you have here an element in this cross product, take the um, algebraic cross product, then you just have a number of elements here and you map it to this one. And okay, here's the index theorem. If, if you have two of these projections, and now we assume they're in the smooth cross product, and we assume G to be of polynomial growth, because we need a theorem on spectral invariance. And then we find that we can define the topological index, which now goes from C0, C of N, on which C acts to C. Okay. And the topological index is given by this formula here. Now you go to the orthogonal fixed point set of S, take one over the determinant of one minus S restricted to the space and multiply it by the twisted trace of the corresponding 
um, churn character expression for this. Okay, and, uh, and the index theorem says this is the index. So the index of D coincides with the topological index given by this thing. Okay, so this was the case, uh, maybe I should say a little bit, um, because that's going, that's something, um, what are the ingredients of this? The ingredient is actually um, that you can define a map from the K theory of the group C star algebra of, P, of G, so where these projections come from, to the K theory of this thing. That's the more complicated operator, and this is an, an isomorphism. And you define this isomorphism with the help of the Euler operator. And the Euler operator, which is going to play also a, a role in, in the next part, is this operator here. So it's an operator on the Schwartz function on Rn with values in forms, and in this case in even forms to odd forms. And what it does, it's, it's the operator you know, like, okay, it's d plus d star. And then we act also on the forms by x dx with wedge and the corresponding adjoint operator um, of, of this operator. So what you, what turns out, this is a UN equivariant elliptic operator. You can determine the fret on index is one. And um, in order to have a zero order operator, you just um, take this whole thing, multiply it by um, e, e star plus one to the power minus one half. So this is an operator of order minus one times an operator of order one, it's zero. And this gives you this map here. So that's the, the, um, the main step in the proof. Okay. Um, we have another example where we computed things. And that's, again, when we are on our end and use Schubin operators. And um, in this case, the subject concerns the kahn moscovici index formula. Um, so again, we do this identification of C um, of T star n with C n, y x p goes to p minus i x. Again, we represent the unitary group by these metaplectic operators, just as we as we did before. But we add another class of operator, and then the shift operators, and and sort of twisted shift operators, so that we get. Heisenberg time, time Heisenberg type operators. So for complex number, so in CN, uh, A minus I K, we take the shift in A, but multiply this by this complex factor here, e to the I K X minus I A K over two. Okay. Then um, we get a more complicated action. So we have, for one thing, the T's, the T's behave nicely. So T Z T W is T Z plus W apart from this factor here, which is given by the imaginary part of the, of the inner product of C and W times minus I and over two. And we also see that the Metaplectic operators act on the shift in a rather simple way. So the metaplectic operator um, associated with the group element G is just the corresponding shift with G applied to um, the uh, number Z. Okay, so this, this shows that if you, okay, if you write these operators, um, maybe it's clear. So, so what are the operators we have? We have the psi's, we have the tz's, and we have the rg's. And we look at the full algebra generated by these operators, and we can always sort them in the right way using these um, relations here. So we could sort the t's, and then we can commute the t's with the r's, and and have a nice algebra. Okay. So I should say something. What is the relation? to this Khan Moscovici local index formula. And I should ask, what, what's the time I have?
Uh, uh, 20 minutes left. 20 minutes left, yeah, sure. Ah, 20 yeah. minutes left. Okay. I thought it was only two. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me see. Um, now we have the speaker algebra. We, um, we want to say what we want to find an explicit representation of this Khan Moscovici cyclic cocycles. So let me recall what suspect of triple, of course, in the seminar non commutative geometry, that's what everybody knows. So we have an algebra A, a complex Hilbert space H, and an unbounded operator D on H, which is supposed to be self adjoint. And you assume that the resolvent is compact. So if you take one plus D squared inverse, this is a compact operator on H. And you assume that for each element in the algebra H, um, the elements map the domain of D to itself and the commutator extends to bounded operator on H. So this is Kahn's definition of respect to triple. Um, sometimes you need more elaborate forms. So created P summable triples. Here assume additional that the Hilbert space is created. So you have a grading operator gamma, a bounded operator in your Hilbert space, gamma is gamma star and gamma square is one. So your Hilbert space decomposes in the plus one and minus one eigenspaces of this H plus and H minus. And correspondingly, you can decompose your operator D in a d plus and a d minus is assorted in this in this matrix here and this is supposed to be an odd operator so it anti-commutes with the grading operator gamma and you assume that this thing is p summable so if you take the corresponding power so one plus d squared to the power minus p over two you assume that this is straight trace class and you assume that um, the elements of your algebra commute with the grading. Okay, what, what Khan showed is that in this space, you can define an abstract version of the churn character, so the churn con character of the spectral triple, which is an element in the uh, periodic even cohomology. And if you have a projection, then you can find the index of the operator D, what the projection um, to both sides as a map from P H plus N to P H minus N as the pairing of this turn character with the class of the projection. So the K class um, of P in K zero of A. Okay, this is the abstract version, and it's it's not perfect for computation. So the idea in Kanoskovici, if I understand this correctly, was to find a representative of this thing which is easier to handle. And you make two assumptions. You assume the spectral triple is regular. So that means if you have an element in your algebra then both the element and the commutator with this element belong to the domains of the iterated commutators with D. So you can form all the iterated commutators and obtain bounded operators. And then they define an algebra of pseudo-differential operators. Let me define the smallest algebra of linear operators um, that contains both this algebra A and the commutators and is closed on the commutators with D squared and the algebra, oh, sorry, and the algebra then is in the space H infinity. So H infinity is subset sort of, of C infinity is the intersection of all the domains of these operators DJ. So if you have this then, what you could do is you define the zeta function. You know, we had this assumption that if, if P is summable, then if 
The real part of Z is sufficiently large. This is going to be a trace class operator, whatever this B is. And you can define the trace and it's going to be a holomorphic function in a half, um, in a half space. And then what you assume is that thing has a meromorphic extension to the whole complex plane. And you assume more, you assume that not only is it meromorphic, but there is a discrete set such that this theta function extends meromorphically to all of C and the poles are at most simple. And of course, the order of B is going to determine a little bit the set, but the set is given by a fixed set F plus the order of B. Okay, if you know pseudo differential operators and say if a standard example would be if B is a function and D is a Dirac operator, then this can be shown by CD's results and complex powers of operators. And you know that precisely this happens. Of course, in the abstract setting, um, this is uh, an assumption that you have to make. Actually, in, in Khan Moscovici, there was an additional assumption on the fact that the theta function decays rapidly along vertical lines, but that could be removed later by work of Carey, Phillips, Rennie, and Sukhchev. Okay, so what's the, the thing? The churn Khan character abstractly defined before has a concrete representative. So this representative in even periodic cyclic cohomology consists of classes Psi zero, Psi two, Psi four, and so on. And they're given with the help of the theta functions. Namely, you, um, you look at the theta function of A zero. So, so um, that, that's an element in, in A. Um, you look at the trace of this operator here. In, in this case, the, the greater trace of this thing. You know this exists. It has a holomorphic, it has a meromorphic extension to Z. And then you look at the residue zero of this function here. Okay. And this is what you call psi zero of A. And then you define the higher cycles by psi two K applied to 2k plus one of these elements by this formula here, which looks a bit more complicated. So you have these elements here. Okay. And you have these brackets alpha 2k. So alpha is a multi index. So it has, in this case, these 2k elements. And this bracket on top is the commutator of B with d squared. So this, this commutator by assumption is a bounded operator. So if you take the commutator with d squared, then the order is raised by one. So altogether you have an operator of order um, length of alpha. And you take d to the power of minus two alpha minus k minus it. Um, okay, you could have, uh, two alpha, sorry. Then you undo this by this power here and add the K and the Z and you take the residue of zero of the trace of this. Okay. Um, and then in order to make this work, of course you have to add universal factors. So in this case, this is minus one to the alpha and, um, and this expression here. So gamma of alpha plus K divided by this thing formed from the alphas. Okay, that's a formula that works out. Um, so in this case, we want to find a triple for our operators. So we call A the algebra generated by our operators TZ and the RGs. So TZ are the shift operators, RG are the lifted unitaries, two metaplectic operators. 
so we can write the elements in this form. That's what I said before. We have these commutation relations between T and R. And um, so our algebra in this case is the, say, algebraic um, cross product of Cn with Un, with Un acting on Cn. And our Hilbert space is given by the, um, the forms over Rn, which has a nat natural grading and even a lot of forms. And the Dirac operator we use is the Euler operator. So the same one as, as we had before, um, we have d plus d star in the Rn direction and we have the action here on the forms. So it's altogether a map from rapidly decreasing functions Rn on even forms to rapidly decreasing function Rn in odd forms. Alma, yeah. sorry, could you go back to the slide? This one? Yeah, so you say Cn cross Un. This confuses me because I thought your T, T's don't commute, right? Or do they? I but they Un acts on Cn. No, but your operator Tz's, they commute? The Tz's up to a factor, yeah. All right, let me go, let me go back. Oh, why can I go back? Sorry. My screen is somehow frozen. Ah. Uh, do you see here? So all, all you get is this factor here. So this looks more like a twisted. Yeah. Okay, I mean, this is the twisted uh, or Heisenberg version. All right, so I was just confused because I thought they're not CN. Okay. Ah, in this sense, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, our Hilbert space is, as I said, this of the other operator, okay. Um, okay, then the first thing we can show is this is a spectral triple that meets the assumption of Kronos Moscovici, regular, finely summable, simple dimension spectrum. And um, now, as I said before, Kron Moscovici defined a, a rather delicate algebra, sort of the smallest one you can get. Um, we work with a slightly larger algebra, which makes things actually rather better than worse, namely consisting of all operators of this form. And now we are back in our game, you know, where we have Schumann operators, dk, we have shift operators, tzk, and we have um, these quantized unitaries, rgk. So it's a slightly larger algebra, um, but easier to handle because we know what the operators are. Up. Yeah. Okay. Um, now this is this is sort of a, a slide that's packed a little bit too big, but uh, uh, with, with too many things on it. But what I wanted to say is, we can explicitly compute these Kahn Moscovici cycles, namely our operators. Uh, okay, the elements of A are sort of sums of this form. So we can assume we have one of those where Cj is an element of Cn and Gj is a unitary. And now we have to determine this cocycle and the result is the following. Okay, psi 2 k is zero in simple cases. Namely, if this mapping, okay, we have two things. We have, um, a mapping of a complex number W to GW plus Z. Z is the one from the shift. If this is no fixed points, and if it does have fixed points, then we get the following expression. So we get first a universal thing, I to the minus two K over two K factorial. Then we get a factor e to the i epsilon. Can I explain in a second? 
And then another factor here, and you see what comes up here is the phi j's in the definition of the operators gj. And at the end, there comes an integral over the fixed point set of a form here. Okay, so what are the components? First, I said before, we have, we have this map G. Okay, basically we have the GJs. Okay, the GJs we multiply and we get another unitary G. Okay, for this G, we take the fixed point set. And then um, the dimension of the fixed point set subtracted from the full dimension, that's the number M that shows up. So this is here. So these are the non-fixed points. So um, if, if G is not one, then it has eigenvalues. Okay, part of them are one, that's the fixed point set. And then the others that of course are complex numbers of the form E to the I phi J and they are M by definition of M. And we call EJ the corresponding eigenvectors. Then we define the complex numbers, the complex number Z. Okay, how is Z defined? Z is the sum of these W2Ks and WJ um, comes from applying the first J of these Gs to this J. CJ are those shifts here. Okay, then we have a scalar factor. You know that these um, T's commute up to a factor. So we take the product of all of the T's and then Z is the sum of these T's here and the inverse. So what remains is, is a complex number of absolute ones. So something of this form here. And um, so what we have in this, in this integral here is, is forms, okay? And the Ws, okay, the Ws were, were defined here. So to such a, a complex number, we associate this form, so a one form, and these are wedged together and multiplied by e to the minus omega, omega is a symplectic form. Um, and this whole integral is the Berezian integral. So what the Berezian integral does to a multilinear map, it just sorts out the, the coefficient of the, of the top term. So of the coefficient of dp1, which dx1, and so on until dpn, which dxn. So a lambda goes to the coefficients of that. Okay, so it, it's a bit of a computation, but you get a very explicit formula for this whole thing. Okay, you can, you can look at special situations, namely uh, non-commutative tori and non-commutative orbifolds and, um, and evaluate this. So if you have N independent over Q vectors in CN, then they generate a lattice in CN. And then what, what you call the algebra of the function of the non-commutative torus is simply when you have only operators of this form um, summation CK and then um, multiple powers of these TVK. Of course you can sort them in, in this way um, because you have this commutation relation that, that we had before. So you can always write operators in this form. You evaluate the, the formula in this particular kind. So you go back to the formula before, look at this thing, and you can write down the formula for this P2K um, in the general case. So you um, have sort of a generalization of the cyclical cycles by Kahn. And the last thing, you can also do this for orbifolds. So the so-called non-commutative orbifolds, one example here is the four orbifolds where you look at a lattice and see, and the lattice is generated, oops, sorry, by 
Um, C1 is a positive number k and C2 is i to the power k. So you take these two vectors, so uh, the real one and the purely imaginary one, you form the associated lattice and um, the rotations, the complex rotations act on, on this lattice. So you, you just move it by a factor of i, then you have your, your operators, your three types of operators, namely you have the Ts um, with C1, you have the T with C2, and you have the multiplications by a factor of I. So you look at the commutation relations that you have. So V and U commute up to a factor, um, conjugating U by R gives, you, gives us V, and conjugation, conjugating B by R gives us U inverse. And um, this factor e to the i theta, this theta is just minus k squared, the thing you plugged in from the top. Okay, this is the so-called uh, non-commutative torus. Um, from U and B with this action by R gives you this cross product algebra um, a theta with C4 acting on it. And um, this, okay, this has been studied before by Farsi, Watling, Walters, Eshtaf, Lück, and Phillips. And let me just show you the results since I'm a bit late. Um, sorry. Ah. You write your elements in this form, you know, because you can all assemble the TZs and then you have powers of Ri. So basically you have a complex number in this lattice L and the factor, a power of I. And for each choice of the Z and alpha, you get a, sorry, a cycle. And you can plug in the formula before. What you see is, if alpha is zero, so if you have no rotation, then you just have shifts. And if, if the shift is by something non-zero, then you have no fixed point set and then the cycles are trivial. So they're only non-trivial uh, cycles if the shift is zero. And then it's easy to evaluate the integral. Namely, you just have the principal term. So you have F zero, zero. And for phi two, um, f zero, df one, df two, all evaluated at um, at zero, where the um, because z is zero. Okay, and if alpha is non-zero, you can also compute these this result. Um, then you always have a non-trivial fixed point set, and um, what what you get is if um, phi two is trivial and phi zero is given by this formula here and it all follows from uh, evaluating the formula that we have this, uh, that we had above. And um, you can also handle the six orbi folds um, just, just in the same way. Okay. That is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Yes, I, I have one uh, small question or comment. Uh, it's about the, um, the exponential of imaginary, purely imaginary exponential that was occurring uh, in front of the integral when you computed the higher cycles, yes, exactly this one. Yes, so I am quite uh, uh, interested in this term, which is before the integral, because somehow I presume this term has, has to do with the action on the transversal of the fixed points. And uh, since we are looking at, you know, higher cycles, uh, it should have a um, geometric meaning, which extends the meaning that normally one takes the determinant, you know, of the one minus the tangent and one takes the inverse. 
So, I mean, uh, I think this, this term, which is before the integral, I find it extremely interesting. I mean, uh, the fact that it's an higher form of the usual terms that people use in trace formulas mm -hmm. when uh, they take the, the contribution of the fixed points. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked at this yet, no. Mm. Sorry? I have not looked at this yet. Yeah, it, it could be, yeah, yes. Yeah, as you see, my, my, my question is more to try to find a conceptual description of this term that mm. could make sense in more generality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, the fact that you have the exponential of a cotangent. I mean, uh, uh, this is very uh, intriguing. I mean, you know. yeah. But but this this comes from a less formula, of course, right? Yeah. Okay. Sure. But it would be interesting to see how it's how it's defined geometrically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's that's my question. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So far, I don't know. Any more? Questions, comments? I, uh, yes, I have a yep. less intelligent question. Um, so in the Dirac operator, I don't uh, completely understand how it is defined. Could you go back to your... <laughs> yeah. so. This? Yeah, this uh, x dx, I don't understand uh, completely what this is because is this a vector in Rn? Yeah, and it acts on this form here, on the form part. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a conjugacy by some... the exponential of minus x squared over two, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah this is a Witten type of operator that uh, you know, which is used uh, uh, in the Morse theory of Witten. Okay, then I can look that up. There's also my information if you look at the paper. Okay. It's fairly clear, right? So. More questions? Okay, so everything seems to be very clear. <laughs> Okay, shall we say thank you to Elmar? And uh, so we meet again in a week's time. Johnny, uh, who is the, what's, what's the title? Well, uh, next time? Yeah. Francesco D'Andrea. Francesco D'Andrea, yes, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you. Nice seeing you again and see you in a week's time. And stay safe. Stay safe. Bye -bye. Stay safe. Bye. Hi. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.